Hey, folks. Uh, welcome once again to the 17th annual Newburyport Documentary Film Festival. Uh, I am Program Director James Sullivan, and very happy to have a special guest with us uh, for today's interview about his feature film that's going to be screening in our festival uh, in September. Uh, Iqbal Barkat is a filmmaker from all the way around the globe in Aus Sydney, Australia. Um, so I'm going to introduce him in a minute. Uh, the film that he's bringing to our festival is called This Is Our School, and it's a film that Iqbal and his team made about um, a school in the most diverse district, uh, uh, most diverse neighborhood of Sydney. Um, we've had a handful of films over the years about various approaches to youth education, uh, and this is a welcome uh, addition to that lineup um, for a number of reasons. It's a really well-made film with a lot of um, uh, great insight into educating young children and teaching diversity. Um, so let's take a look at the trailer for This Is Our School, and then I'll introduce Iqbal. Across and around. Down, across. Good, and again. Wonderful. One of the very big things about teaching kids is to, it's about teaching resilience. Mm -hmm. These kids that we have now are moving into a totally different world, um, one that's changing. Okay. The warmth in the ocean kills the coral, gets rid of all the colour and the biodiversity within the ocean. What can you guys make to solve that problem? And the solar panels run the motor. Yep. And then inside there's like like a control bit. Like yeah. Cool. You got to represent Australia changing the way that we do things in the sea, which is good. So this is Hadia. Hadia speaks Farsi and this is Mohammed speaks Farsi, okay? So, can you just explain to mum, 115, she can meet them at the bottom of the stairs. Who's going to explain that? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Iqbal Barkat. Um, Iqbal, you, uh, I just want to mention that you are a filmmaker, you've, uh, you've made past documentaries, and you're also a professor in uh, media and communications, am I correct, at Macquarie University in Sydney? That's right, yes. Um, so thanks for being here with us today, or t tonight. What time is it there in Australia? Uh, it's 11 p.m. Well, all right. Well, yeah. thank you for staying up with us. Um, <laughs> it's first thing in the morning. I'm having my coffee. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so am I. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so, so tell me first of all um, about. So this is very different from the. I think was Mortars the last feature uh, documentary feature that you made, or have there been others in between? Yeah, I, I made Mortars, but also my work uh, is in experimental cinema as well. So I've made smaller works. Uh, most of my works are in the installation space as well. So I make works with other performers um, around dance and dances. Yeah. So, so can mm -hmm. you explain um, f first of all? Tell tell us a little bit about Mortars, which you made I think seven or eight years ago. Yeah, uh, uh, that that was a film as uh, to respond to the the refugee crisis in inverted commas in Australia. There's no real real refugee crisis, but of course it was a a, a beat up attempt uh, to basically demonize a lot of the refugees and um, the ethnic minorities who are living in Australia. So we imagine a scenario where uh, a, a woman. 
um, an elderly woman, or herself a Dutch immigrant to Australia who came uh, after the Second World War. Uh, she sort of housed a refugee in a house. Um, so basically that we saw the interaction between uh, a white person and if you like a brown a person and so um, to see what what was that interaction like so she was played by a, a real person and she had a, a, a dilemma she was fighting the state because uh, she the there was a military base very close to her house and they were conducting explosions which were actually destroying controlled explosions which were actually destroying the foundations of her house so she was making a massive claim against the state and the claim had been had been going on for 40 years and so in that situation we imagine a refugee who has come from a traumatic environment to live with her on her property and so that that was that was the film and what we did with the film was we traveled with the film around australia uh, showing it to communities across uh, the country particularly in new south wales and in queensland and uh, what we did was we also had refugee advocates there so the film was 70 minutes but the screening usually went on for two and a half hours because people wanted to talk about these issues so iqbal um I, tell me if you can about how you came to this subject because it's very different than the last one right i mean i'm i'm gonna take a guess that maybe your own family is involved in the school system on some level um actually it wasn't um a family member but it was an ex-student uh so um you know this student i've been teaching filmmaking in sydney for over 10 years now and this uh, student or ex-student of mine uh, she couldn't decide whether she wanted to uh, be a filmmaker or a teacher. And finally, she decided to go into teacher's training. Hmm. And uh, at her first school, uh, she she had a year stint. She gave me a call. She says, Iqbal, I really think you need to visit this school. So, and, you know, it never happened for a long time. You know, I kept missing appointments. She, you know, yeah, she couldn't make it, etc. But one day, even though it's very interesting, I wasn't feeling really that well that day. And I just made it to the school. And when I arrived, I discovered that it was really an, an, a unique environment. Firstly, it was a, in a very interesting suburb in Sydney. Uh, because, you know, we speak about diversity in Sydney, but what this suburb also had was class diversity as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with the rising prices of property, there were, you know, expensive properties, there were rich people, and there were also struggling families there. And also many of the Afghan refugees were mm -hmm. settled around this area as well. So like the school population, the major, the perhaps the main uh, ethnic group in in the school would be Afghan refugees and migrants. Yeah, so that, that I would say they would be the main. Um, so I visited the school, but what really enticed me about the school was that, you know, you go into a primary school and it's mayhem, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's like utter <laughs> madness and chaos. Mm -hmm. So I arrived during recess and rather than mayhem, I, I, on, I think the only way I could describe it was almost it was like a utopia of a school. Mm. Kids were happy. They were playing. Kids came up to me and said, are you lost? What are you are you looking for? <laughs> you know, can, can we help you? You know, so it was really a unique experience. Usually kids don't care, right? I mean, there's someone coming in. They, they are doing their own stuff. They are caught up in their own little worlds. But here the kids were interested in what was going on. They came up to me. They guided me to the, to the principal's office. So it was a unique environment. And then I met uh, the, the executive team of the school. And they were really visionary. And I said, you know, I'm so impressed that I want to do something in this school. And so I said, uh, I teach filmmaking. I have students uh, who are learning to be filmmakers. Why don't we come into the school and do a digital storytelling program for you guys? It's a simple program. Um, you know, it's open to anybody and everybody will come in after school once a week and we'll do this program. So I was there for an entire year doing this program. It's just fan fantastic program. And at the end of the year, uh, the principal approached me and said, why don't you make a film about our school? So, and, you know, I was already a familiar face in the school. The kids knew me, you know, so mm. 
Yeah, and they knew uh, that we were carrying cameras all around the school. But I wasn't really sure if there was a film there at all, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, and I did not, you know, I was thinking that did the principal want me to make a corporate video about the school? And I didn't want to do that, you know. So I brought in a friend of mine, a highly experienced documentary filmmaker in Australia called Marie Delovsky very successful a documentary filmmaker and i said you know is there something in this school so we sort of started visiting the school thinking about it and we finally she said i think there's something in this school there's something be really beautiful there is a story that needed to be told about what's happening here in the school and so we said yes to the principal and and because in a way the school executive the school approached us so that made our relationship really simple because uh already i had been there for a year but because it was also the school decision to invite us it uh you know they sort of arranged the parents and all that thought it was fine that we were making a film they trusted us implicitly with the lives that were so you know we had full access they trusted us so much that we were in really sensitive meetings for example because they knew that if we felt that the f we couldn't screen it to a general audience, we wouldn't. That that yeah. that's that's so interesting <clears throat> that how that unfolded because you know I'm a journalist. I've done plenty of things in in school systems, and you you know you, you know it's it's not typical to have that kind of access in school systems. Yeah. Usually, the administrators and the parents are very wary of you know outsiders coming into the school system, and yeah. um, obviously, the film shows complete access with these yeah. kids and their teachers and how they're interacting. Um, so it makes perfect sense that you <clears throat> had to be there for a year in the mm -hmm. kids' lives on a teaching level or a you know um, mentoring level, um, so that the school system knew you. Everybody knew you and and your yeah. team. Um, that makes perfect sense. You t before we went live, you were talking a little bit about the process of making the film. Do you want to talk? So it's very much immersive the way that you just sort of you know immerse the cameras in the system, in 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 the school inside the school walls to just show what the what what an average day or the average days are like there, and there's no sort of you know hand holding or, or um, voiceover to guide a viewer. It's just, you know, you're immersed in the situation. So do you want to talk about your inspiration for that? Because that's, uh, uh, you know, of, uh, uh, of interest to, to Bostonians, I think. And you also yeah. used a phrase um, that I would love for you to repeat about how you visualized how the film was going to come out. Yeah, I mean, uh, firstly, we really wanted this to be... Um, uh, an observational film. I think we sort of decided right at the start that that would be uh, that it would be an observational film, and our inspiration was definitely Frederick Wiseman, and uh, so high school was was something that really inspired us. Let's just uh, sorry, sorry, Iqbal. I'm going to interrupt interrupt you for one second because just for for anyone who's unfamiliar, yeah. Please be familiar with Frederick Wiseman, um, kind of like the dean of documentary filmmaking and specifically of this verite type of filmmaking, right? So, yes. Frederick Wiseman is, you know, lives in uh, or, or has lived in Cambridge, uh, Mass for for ages. He's uh, in his late eighties, I think, at this point, and has made dozens and dozens of long form documentaries, including uh, City Hall, which was about. Have you have you seen City Hall? It's four hours. It's yeah. about Boston City Hall. And I think it was nominated for an Oscar last year. Mm -hmm. So Frederick Wiseman in the in the documentary community, for those who don't know, is a uh, massive, uh, you know, living legend. So sorry, I just want to make sure that uh, that was clear to anyone who may not be familiar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. So as I said, he's a great inspiration, and his method is usually to immerse himself uh, in a particular social environment for between six and eight weeks, and f not deciding what the film is going to be not deciding that there's a character that i'm following or uh, a particular trajectory that i'm following so in a sense he let spaces speak for themselves and so that's exactly what we wanted to do to allow this space in a sense to speak for itself so what we discovered was when we thought about the film as i mentioned to you earlier james uh, the film was we thought about it like a necklace with jewels all around and we know we had these beautiful moments so in a way all we needed was like that string to tie all these jewels together i mean we are filming the lives of kids so in a sense, you know, they 
kids are fantastic on camera. We know that. I mean, Alfred Hitchcock was completely wrong when he says that, you know, mm. not to film with kids. I mean, <laughs> the camera, cinema loves children. It's just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they, we represent them really well in cinema. And so I think... Um, so that that was what I, I was I was describing to you that it, the film did not have a, a we did not follow one character for example neither the executive or one particular teacher so the way we did it was my I tried to focus on the upper levels and uh, my co-director Marie Dolovsky she focused on the 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 junior levels on the on the K one to uh, three years one to three. Yeah, so that's that's how we we made the film. Why should uh, a a film audience, you know, halfway around the globe, uh, care about this particular school system? Uh, sorry, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna feed you anything. I just want you to answer that first, and then I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna ask a follow up question. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you see, I think that uh, in a sense, what we see here are a group of people coming together to do something incredible with all the challenges that they have, the challenges imposed by uh, the government, by the state system, uh, the challenges imposed by poverty, by economics, by structures. So what they do is that, in a sense, they try to abstract themselves. They try to move these structures outside the school gate and to see how they can build the lives of these children, do something worthwhile for these children. And we see that. Like the, I mean, we know teachers are just some of the most incredible people in the world. I have nothing but respect for teachers. But in this school, for example, uh, they spend their own pocket money, they buy computers so that the kids, like the teacher you saw in the trailer, for example, he invested a virtual reality system so the kids would have would be able to learn virtual reality. And what's amazing was most of the kids in his class, when they enter his class, they don't speak English. But because they want to learn VR, they learn English very, very quickly because they're interested <laughs> in VR. So English is a way to get to VR. Yeah. So that's amazing. And now you mentioned that the neighborhood um, has um, a, a large number of Afghani families, right? Yes. So that may be part of the answer to the question I just asked you, because we're all dealing with the fallout of um, what's going on in Afghanistan right now. And this is sort of tangentially related, obviously, because this is where a lot of those families have migrated um, fairly recently, I would assume. Right. Uh -huh. Yes. Over the last uh, decade or so, you know, since um, the war started in uh, uh, the war is 20 years. So o over the last 20 years, I would say. Yeah. We know that, uh, you know, Australia's politics has had, some of the uh, similar debates that American politics has had over the last several years. How are the Afghanis being received? Um, you know, you were talking about how this particular neighborhood where this school is, is both rich folks and underprivileged folks. And I'm going to guess mm -hmm. that, you know, at least some of the Afghani families are part of that lower class, right? Um, in this neighborhood, yes. how are they being received and welcomed or, you know, you see, uh, uh on a on an interpersonal level, on a local level, uh, there are no issues really because you know people are people and and they live their lives, right? But of course, you know we do have uh, politicians that uh, try to dog whistle, for example. So once in a while, you know we have these disruptions in our society. But there is also a problem that many of uh, our Afghan refugees at the moment are still being held in detention centers across Australia. They are still held in offshore detention. Australia is the first country to trial a system of offshore detention. So people who would come by boats would, or they, you know, they try not to settle them on the they mainland. They won't even let them set foot yeah. on the mainland, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So uh, those people are still incarcerated in offshore detention camps. So we still have, uh, and many of them are Afga not only Afghanis, of course, the many Iraqis and Syrians and people from Sri Lanka. Yeah. So I don't want to get into a political 
I don't want to turn this into a political, uh, you know, just debate, but it seems to me like what, what can you, what can the government charge them with if they haven't even set foot on Australian land yet? Oh yeah. I mean, the fact that, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're charged as illegal entrance. Like, so, you know, so they've they're, 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 once they've entered, uh, Australian waters, I guess is the, yes, the, that's right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just to clear that up because it's, yeah. my but first, it, obviously it, it, I haven't even, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I think I think what's what's incredible, uh, James, is that with the film, right? In a sense, you know, these issues around uh, refugees and all that, we feel them in, in some ways. But at the same time, as as I mentioned earlier, they are almost outside the school gates. So you know, for example, there's a there's a kid in the school, uh, and he just told his teacher quite casually that his grandfather was killed by the Taliban. You know, so um, so those things are there. But uh, in, in a sense, then they run out and join the other kids. And uh, so the school is pretty amazing. There's no bullying, for example, uh, no suspension. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the kids are, are, are really well regarded, well treated. And, you know, and because of that, I think it's a, it's a really successful microcosm about how communities, what they can do for themselves in a way. Well, that's the yeah. whole Wiseman idea, isn't it? Like take yes. a take a take a place, uh-huh. and find what's microcosmic about it, right? It, you know, yeah. I mean, it is its own, it, you know, self-contained universe, right? Yeah. And that's that's exactly what this school is, and that's what makes it such a uh, great subject for your film. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to wrap up there. Um, we, we we hope to see you back. We, we'll we'll have this discussion. We we'll hope to see you back for a for a post screening uh, conversation um, in a few weeks. But in the meantime, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today, tonight. <laughs> um, don't have too much of that coffee, or you'll never get to sleep tonight. <laughs> and uh, thanks, thanks for thanks for making the, the time and for a great conversation. Thanks um, so much, James. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and I, I hope everyone enjoys the film as well. I think it has a lot to say to our contemporary society today. Yeah. I agree absolutely. Um, we'd like to just make sure we thank our main sponsors for the Doc Fest, and uh, thanks and join us for the next interview. Um, we'll see you soon. <laughs>